Vlad is utterly shocked when he hears that he will become an honorary knight. However, Joseph casually explains that he will be treated like a knight in places where Alicia's name is recognized and revered. This is still really big news to Vlad. He can't believe you will be made a knight of any sort, at least not at this age. It's such a crazy feeling that just overwhelms him. While he's trying to comprehend the current situation, Joseph chimes in again, suggesting that Vlad's knighthood will basically be limited to Dharmer since Alicia just became a baron. At this point, he finally understands the situation and almost seems relieved when he realizes what being an honorary knight means. He knows that becoming a real knight can never be that easy. Vlad holds the purple handkerchief that Alicia gave him as he ponders deeply about everything. Joseph interrupts these thoughts by reminding him that he got the gift because of a mistake, and he also advises him not to lose the handkerchief, because it's actually Alicia's honor and not just a random piece of cloth. Vlad anxiously asks Joseph what would happen if he lost the handkerchief. Joseph coldly informs him that he'll have to take responsibility for himself because he was the one who accepted it with his own hands. Hearing these words, fear grips him because he can tell from Joseph's eyes that the consequences of such a thing will be more than Joseph can handle. With this in mind, Vlad holds the handkerchief tightly and resolves not to lose the special cloth at any cost. Just then, Joseph pulls out a small piece of paper that looks like a contract. He claims that the issues ended abruptly and informs Vlad that he won't be needing the piece of paper anymore, thanks to him. Vlad deduces that the paper is a promissory note, and Joseph confirms this, revealing that the paper is a certificate that says that Alicia borrowed 10,000 gold. That's a huge sum. Vlad is taken aback by it, and that's when Joseph explains that the gold was money to secure Alicia's soldiers in case she lost the duel. If she had lost the duel, she would have been forced to surrender herself because that would have been the only way to save herself from her uncle. However, Joseph also reveals that Alicia didn't borrow the gold. Upon hearing this, Vlad asks if there's a reason Joseph brought Miss Alicia since he already knows that losing the duel means losing the right to succeed. In response, Joseph explains that his cause is like a spark in the ashes, which one right encounter with the wind can rekindle. In other words, if Alicia is within the grasp of the Bayzid family, then Andre can't help but feel pressure. At this point, Vlad is starting to understand this game a bit, after seeing how nobles live their lives looking for justification. His thoughts are interrupted when he suddenly senses something strange behind him. Joseph notices Vlad's expression, so he asks Vlad what's wrong. Vlad reveals that he heard something from the woods to the west. Elsewhere in the forest, it all looks so peaceful at one moment. But then all of a sudden, huge dust clouds erupt on the horizon. That's when we see the army of horse riders coming toward Joseph's convoy. Vlad sees this through the window and is immediately horrified by the army of bandits headed their way. He quickly raises the alarm to inform the others and pulls out his sword as well to prepare for the imminent battle. However, just when he's about to lift his sword for the fight, Joseph stops him and quietly tells him to put his blade away. Vlad is pretty confused, but Joseph just wears a smug look on his face and assures Vlad that he made preparations for this even before the duel started. In a surprising twist, it turns out that the bandits weren't coming to fight or rob Joseph's convoy because the next thing we see is that they're bowing to Joseph. Their white-haired leader of the bandits informs Joseph that they ran a bit late because they were trying to collect a fair price for something. The scar-faced dude remains on his and presents Joseph with a bloody sack. Seeing this, Joseph asks if that sack is what he requested because he knows that he ended up asking for something else. Joseph tells the guy that he did a good job and asks him to stand up. The scar-faced bandit leader gets up and immediately spots Vlad standing near Joseph. The man wonders if he's the young vassal who received Lady Alicia's honor by hand. Word about what happened has already spread all over the land, and when he says this, Joseph simply confirms it. Joseph is surprised that the news spreads so fast, but he tells the bandit leader that he can adore him later. He gets nervous just looking at the scary bandit's face, and it gets even more frightening when the white-haired stranger somewhat glares at him. Vlad becomes pretty terrified when he sees this. He realizes that the aura he senses from the guy is nothing like what he feels from other knights. Instead, what he can sense is similar to the smell of danger that the back alleys of Sora reeked of. With this in mind, Vlad feels like his instincts are telling him that the scar-faced man is not one to be trifled with. Joseph suddenly asks the bandit leader to follow the convoy if he's coming back to Sturma, but the scary guy politely declines, claiming that he and his men have to get back a bit quicker. After all, they're using horses. Joseph is a bit disappointed, but he lets them go and thanks the leader for his services. 
Once again, in response, the guy claims that he was merely loyal to his duty as Bayzid's hidden sword, which is most likely just a fancy name for an assassin. Hearing the strange title for the first time, Vlad is a little confused and quite frightened. So, he starts to wonder who the hell these people are because it's pretty obvious now that they're not your regular bandits. Besides that, he's also really curious about what's in that bloody sack they brought with them. Joseph turns around and notices Vlad looking at it. So he asks Vlad if he wants to know what the sack is. Vlad immediately admits that he is a little curious. So Joseph vaguely tells him that it contains the world of nobles, which is the world of the cold, brutal, and unforgiving. We get an idea of what's inside even though it was already kind of obvious with the bloodstains on the back. Back at home, Joseph's father reveals that a group of pilgrims is passing through Sturma, so he asks his advisor if he should greet them. In response, the white-bearded old man suggests that the visitors don't seem to want that, especially since they said that they just quietly see the dragon trail and then leave. Hearing this, the head of the Bayzid family thinks that these must be the voices of the gods who desire nothing because he hasn't seen such sincere pilgrims in a very long time. Even though they don't seem to want any greeting or attention, Joseph's father still thinks that it should be okay to look after the pilgrims without their knowledge. His advisor already knew that he would say something like that, and Count Bayzid just claims that it's only because one has the right to enjoy what they're deserving to see. Seeing that the nobleman wants to do this, the advisor assures his master that he'll make preparations to watch over the pilgrims. Besides that, the master would also like to talk about his second son Vlad. He heard about the great feat that they accomplished this time around. The advisor confirms this, revealing that there was even a word in the report that would make an old man's heart race. Count Bayzid is intrigued by this and links it to the Swordmaster's first code. He feels that it's a nostalgic word that he hasn't heard in a very long time. Elite education began with the election of those with proven blood and talent from the start, so these young swordsmen were practically diamonds in the rough that was managed with care during their training. That's why it's rare for a situation to reach such extreme points that would require the call for the first code. Joseph's father feels that it must have been a rare sight in today's times when knights are nurtured so preciously and the advisor suggests that the master would have loved it if he had been there to see Vlad in action. The Count agrees, but he claims that he's not the only one who would have loved it because he's sure that a few other people would have loved it as well. Thinking about Vlad's feet, the golden generation of Bayzid comes to his mind, and he feels proud just thinking about it. Joseph's father believes that at this rate, the old guys will come with treats in their hands for the newbies. Upon hearing this, the advisor reveals that he's sure Joseph would love that. The head of the Bayzid family closes his eyes and thinks back to the time when his second son was practically gasping for air. He thought that Joseph had given up at that time, but Joseph surprised him by crawling through the mud, holding him back until he brought a shining thing into their home. That's right, he's talking about the shining boy from the back alleys of Sora. Unfortunately, this good feeling quickly changes as a wave of sadness washes over the father's face. He believes that he has a lot to think about indeed because, in the end, he can only choose one of his two sons. Elsewhere in Sturma, the other vassals are having a meal when one of them suddenly informs the others that Vlad is back after completing his mission in Dermer. They all start to discuss the things they've heard so far. One wonders if it's true that Vlad dueled a knight, and another hears that he created his world as well. Sobanin, who's still Vlad's biggest hater among the vassals, refuses to believe the rumors. He claims that the stories are ridiculous and impossible because, as far as he's concerned, Vlad can't use Aura. While they're all gossiping, someone suddenly walks into the hall, and we see that it's the man of the moment. Vlad admits that he's starving and thinks about how it's been like a month since he last entered the place. He sees all the vassals dining at their tables and also notices how they all look afraid. The moment they see him, they quietly turn back to their meals, and this makes Vlad realize that it doesn't matter if someone comes from a high or low status family. Whether the gap in status between them is big or small doesn't matter anymore because the children's alley fight is over. This is all because of the appearance of that one person who trod in a different world from the rest. The next thing we see is a plate of sausages being devoured by Vlad. He munches down on the food, making it obvious just how much he missed the place. Unfortunately, he's not able to enjoy his meal in peace with all the other vassals staring at him and whispering about him. It's starting to get on his nerves because it's becoming too uncomfortable to deal with while eating. When he says this, the fat kid eating next to him informs him that it's going to be like this for a while, especially since everyone here roughly knows what happened in Dmer. Vlad Clay locks his finger as he realizes just how quickly the rumors spread. 
The vassal is pretty much his only friend in the place, so he's the only one who cares enough to ask Vlad what his plans are for vacation. He is taken aback by the talks of a vacation, so his buddy realizes that he didn't know. He then informs him that the vassals get a vacation period twice a year. He explains that all the followers have received holidays this week already, so this makes Vlad wonder if he's going to get one too. After all, he's quite new here, and he's not even a disciple from a precious household. On top of that, he doesn't even have anywhere to go for any kind of vacation. Upon hearing this, the chubby kid's face lights up, and he doesn't even hesitate to invite Vlad to his family home for the vacation. It obviously won't be a problem because his dad is the one officially inviting Vlad to the house. At this point, his determination to convince Vlad increases, so he assures he that the serving part at his house is done properly. He claims that they even provide unlimited freshly roasted meat. The offer sounds good, but Vlad still has to think about it to know if it's worth coming over. Seeing the hesitation, the chubby vassal suddenly remembers that Vlad once said he was looking for horses. He reminds Vlad how he once revealed what his household does, and he explains that his family can arrange horses from anywhere near this area. This finally catches Vlad's attention. He's intrigued, but then Vlad reveals that they even have some horses that have a better pedigree than Jaeger's horse. In other words, they have more expensive horses. Upon hearing this, he immediately agrees to spend the vacation at the guy's place. Vlad is a bit too serious about it, but the fat kid is just happy that he gets to have a friend over at his place for the holidays. Later that afternoon, we see Sir Jaeger beating the out of he in the name of intense training. The advanced knight casually uses his sword to slap Vlad in the face during their sparring session, but Vlad doesn't go down that easily. From the look on his face, he is taking a toll on him, and Jaeger notices this. So, when Vlad tries to attack, he counters it and tells Vlad to focus. The green-eyed knight is playing right now. The guy holds one hand behind his back and uses the other to frustrate all of Vlad's attempts to land a hit. Despite being countered over and over again, he doesn't give up. He keeps throwing everything he's got at Jaeger, but Jaeger just seems upset when he sees that Vlad is trying to do something beyond his abilities. So he lands a killer strike on Vlad's back. Under normal circumstances, such a blow should paralyze a man, even though they're just using wooden swords. However, he survives the brutal hit. He needs some time to recover from it, so he finally falls on his knee to catch a breather. While he's resting, Sir Jaeger reminds him that he told him not to try something if he knows he can't do it. Sir Jaeger is mad because he feels that Vlad now thinks he's big enough to try things that are beyond his capacity since he dueled with a knight in Dermer. Vlad is stunned when he hears this, but he doesn't say anything. He's probably still trying to catch his breath. Unfortunately, Jaeger gets even more upset and concludes that the vassal is ignoring him. He is shocked again when he hears this too, but still, he's too stunned to speak. Jaeger glares at him angrily, and when he realizes that the knight means business, he becomes afraid. So he quickly apologizes to Jaeger. After the apology, Jaeger tells Vlad not to come to the training ground if he feels like he's being forced to do it. Furthermore, the advanced knight also makes it clear that he doesn't want Vlad to come to him anymore if he now feels that he can train without him. After these short statements, he draws the curtains on their training for the day and walks away, telling Vlad that he can leave. Vlad is obviously in a bad mood, so he quietly walks away in the opposite direction. Jaeger looks back at his vassal and admits that Vlad's results so far shine, as well as his achievements. The advanced knight is certainly proud of him for this, but he feels that Vlad's qualities are still unpolished, just like sand on a seashore. Jaeger thinks that he is still weak enough to be blown off by a huge wave at any moment. This bothers Jaeger because he knows how dangerous it is, but what can he do except guide Vlad? Elsewhere, we see Vlad walking down one of the hallways with his sword. The voice in his head suddenly speaks up, reminding him that he told him to focus on the basics. The voice claims that he would have been angry at Vlad as well, but Vlad explains that he was just trying to bring out the aura. Again, the voice responds by reminding him that not all knights can use aura. He also explains that this doesn't mean that knights who can't use it have a low level. The man in his head informs him that aura only manifests the possibility that one can rise higher. He also tells Vlad that he shouldn't forget that it hasn't been long since he wielded the sword. Essentially, he's just trying to tell the boy from Sara to be patient with himself because a great flower only blooms with a solid foundation. He goes on to assure he that Sir Jaeger would have scolded him if he wasn't worthy. So he advises Vlad to think over what Jaeger told him again. After receiving this little pep talk, he calms himself down and sighs as he decides to take the advice. He's already used to contempt and ridicule, 
but he feels really bad about today because what he saw on Jaeger's face was a look of disappointment. He thinks back to the expression he saw on the advanced knight's face, and it feels even worse than being hit in the back with a wooden sword. The voice in his head makes the already sad moment even worse for Vlad by reminding him that he couldn't even bring up the vacation thing because of how mad Jaeger was. He is pissed when he remembers that he didn't get a chance to talk about the vacation, but he quickly calms himself down and discards the thought, feeling that he shouldn't even care about a vacation in this situation. He looks at the sword and smiles, thinking that he should practice swinging it today until he clears his mind of any thoughts. Later that night, when everyone else is probably sleeping, Vlad goes to the woods and begins swinging the sword endlessly. He grips the handle firmly and takes big swings, following the path of the sword. He does it to the point that he creates a huge slash in the earth. By this time, he's pretty tired, so he pants heavily and catches his breath. The voice in his head suddenly suggests that they wrap up the exercise for the night, but Vlad is surprised that he wants to end it already. The voice informs him that he already met the daily quota a while ago and explains to him that he'll only exhaust himself if he burns too quickly. The stubborn boy from the back alley doesn't want to hear this, but the voice keeps trying to change his mind. He reminds Vlad that everything he's been working hard to achieve ever since will all be in vain if he ends up suffering an injury or even worse. After hearing all of this, Vlad finally agrees to call it a night, even though he's not too happy about it. He stares up at the moonlit sky, feeling troubled at first. But after a while, he starts to feel something different. It's more like a feeling of confidence that washes over him. As he stands outside that night, he finally starts to see reason with the voice in his head as he realizes that he only just obtained something that shines while he's glowing under the night sky. Jaeger comes outside and sees him from the balcony, seeing Vlad shining so brightly. He can't help but watch him. He sees how Vlad's gaze doesn't shift from the moon shining down on him, and this sight makes him feel something inside of him. When Vlad doesn't shift his gaze, Jurger looks up at the sky as well and concludes that his vassal is like a wolf that chases the moon. The knight and his disciple just keep staring at the moon that night, and while they're busy stargazing, the scene starts to shift slowly in a pretty cool transition. The scene changes, and the next thing we see is the night sky in a place called Trinova, which is a county of another place called Ravnoma. Unlike Sturma, which is currently peaceful enough for Jaeger and Vlad to stare calmly at the moonlit sky, Trinova is presently on fire. The county is burning on the inside and the outside, and as the flames consume all the structures around it, all that can be heard are the screams of the residents and the crackling of the fire. This isn't some natural disaster, and the city is actually under attack. Inside the throne room, we see that a massacre is underway. Bloody corpses of knights lie all over the room, and the last living knight is suddenly confronted by the killer. He was already seriously injured, but this mysterious assassin had been wondering where he was just so he could finish the job. With a bloody sword in hand, the unknown killer walks toward the knight and suggests that the wounded warrior is only fulfilling his last duty. The injured knight pants heavily and struggles to talk as he points out how the killer ultimately came all this way to find him. It's at this point that we get to see who this ominous assassin is, and surprisingly it turns out to be Godin, the same dangerous man who killed Vlad's boss back in Sara. With his dying breath, the injured knight tells Godin that he doesn't need to follow orders blindly just because the saying goes that the Lord's name comes before honor. He reminds God that the knights of the former Count Gator weren't like that, but the ruthless assassin just informs him that it's the reason all those knights are dead now. In response, the injured knight tells Godin that his light will also go out one day, but until then, he wants the killer to pass one last message to Count Gator, saying that he'll be waiting in hell. When he says this, Godin raises his sword for the finishing blow and assures the dying man that he will pass the message before sending him to the afterlife. Vlad is surprised when he hears Master Joseph telling him about a vacation. He probably didn't expect this kind of news because he had already made up his mind to focus on his swordsmanship without any breaks. However, the young master informs him that he will be going on a vacation because he's been invited by the Kaner household. He asks to confirm this, and Vlad is surprised that Joseph even knows about it. He is about to ask the young master how he even found out, but before he can finish talking, Joseph explains that rumors spread quickly. Apparently, Sir Gregory's vassal poetry has been babbling all about it in excitement. Upon hearing this, Vlad immediately realizes how the news got to Joseph. Poetry probably blabbed about it to Sir Gregory, who then told Jaeger, and he ended up telling the young master about it. At this point, he's already sure what's going on. Joseph claims that he was going to give Vlad a vacation anyway, 
so now he feels that there's no reason to send him when he's already decided where he wants to go. Vlad thanks him in response, but he's still a bit pissed at Jaeger for ratting him out. He glares at the knight, but Jaeger pretends like he didn't do anything wrong. Joseph notices the awkwardness in the room and becomes quite confused at first, but then he immediately concludes that something has happened. He knows that the awkward silence will be gone if he interferes, but he decides to keep quiet because he knows that some relationships are just meant to be respected and left alone. The tension in the room continues to build, and after a while, Vlad admits that it's getting hard to even breathe. Even though he's very annoyed with Jaeger, he still feels that it would be better if he just greets Jaeger and excuses himself. While he's still pondering on this, Sir Jaeger suddenly speaks up and reminds Vlad that a knight must never let go of his sword at any moment, even though he's on vacation. Vlad is caught off guard by the statement, but he also knows that it's true, so he accepts the advice without argument. Jaeger warns Vlad, promising him that he'll notice the effects if he misses a day of training. But even worse, he tells him that other people will notice if he skips training for even just a week. He knows that Vlad is not the lazy type that would need to be told about training even if he's not told, but he feels that it won't do any harm to remind him. With this in mind, he simply tells his young vassal that they'll see when he gets back from his vacation. Vlad is so glad when he hears this because it means that he's finally gotten Jaeger's permission and approval to go. Joseph notices just how happy the young swordsman is, but then quickly tells him not to get his hopes too high about the horses. After all, his current problem will probably be difficult for even the Kaner household to deal with. The young master practically cuts Vlad's joy short with this statement, and then he tells him to analyze how much the horses reject him, so that he can find out the area where the horses that reject him the least are from. Vlad takes the advice, confirming that he understands it. So, the young master tells him that he can leave until they meet again after a week. The young knight in training starts to walk out of the room, but then he stops when Joseph suddenly tells him that he doesn't need to get gifts on the way back. Vlad is stunned to hear this, but then he assures the young master that he won't forget. In his mind, Joseph is actually saying that he needs gifts because he remembers that the guy seemed to enjoy the jamming that poetry got him before. Vlad finally exits the room, leaving Jaeger and Joseph alone in there. The young master still can't believe that the Kano household invited the young boy from Sara to spend a vacation with them. Jaeger already seems to know why Joseph is so concerned, so he suggests that Vlad might meet a certain someone if he's lucky. The young master agrees, recalling how both Vlad and this mysterious person are both really notable figures. In response, Jaeger asks what would happen if someone was keeping an eye on Vlad and this person, which leaves Joseph speechless for a bit until he finally comes up with an answer. Joseph suggests that anyone who would keep tabs on them would also be the kind of person to ask for something when they want it. Despite knowing that this is most likely the case, Joseph reveals that he has no plan to give anything that is asked of him if that's the case. Elsewhere, we see Vlad being rather perplexed. He doesn't seem to know what's going on, and he certainly has no idea where he is. It turns out that he's just being given a new cloak to test out. It was Joseph's mom is the one responsible for this latest gift shower, and even though he is pretty overwhelmed by the whole thing, she seems to think that the color suits him well. As far as she's concerned, he's well-suited to leather armor, and even more than that, she feels that everything suits him well because of his strong bones. This is why she doesn't mind making him new clothes because it's worth her while just seeing him try them on. Despite being very shy and uncomfortable, he's also really grateful, so he thanks Lady Oksana for her kindness. After that, she asks him about his invitation to spend a vacation with the Kana household. Vlad confirms that the rumor is indeed true so she reminds him that people always need to be well-dressed and present neatly whenever they are invited to someone else's place. She explains that this is just basic manners and a way not to give one's parents a bad name. The young swordsman just feels down and speechless when Lady Oksana says this because he knows she is actually right. But then she drops another bombshell by telling him that he shouldn't give her a bad name. In other words, she's telling him that she's pretty much his mother. Lady Oksana embraces him again but he is so stunned by what she just said that to move. It's like he's frozen in shock, and his eyes just widen as he tries to process everything. As for the kind woman, she just gives him a warm smile in response. Her yellow eyes shine as she looks at Vlad, and he immediately gets flustered. He's blushing so hard that his ears are even turning red at this point. As such, he just accepts her advice and assures her that he will not give her a bad name while he's away on vacation. Vlad bows his head as he says this. And while he's still in this position, she surprises him again by informing him that she'll assign a tutor to him when he returns from vacation. 
After all, she doesn't want him making any more mistakes like when he received a lady's honor with his hand. She suggests that such a blunder should only happen once, and he is so embarrassed when he remembers what he did. So he nervously asks her to forgive him. Lady Oksana informs him that the title of a knight is similar to that of a semi-aristocrat, and for this reason, he needs to learn the appropriate way to act at all times. When she says this, he takes the piece of advice and promises to keep it in mind. The kind woman then reveals a basket of fruits being carried by a servant and tells Vlad that he can take it along with him. Apparently, Joseph brought the basket because it's not good manners to go to someone's house empty-handed. Once again, the young swordsman bows before Lady Oksana and thanks her for her careful consideration. In response, she just waves it off with another gentle smile and then tells him to have a relaxing time during his vacation. Later, we see Vlad making his way out of the place with the basket of lemons in hand. He closes the door, but then suddenly starts to feel suspicious about something. He looks out the window and then sees his reflection and how different he has become since he left Sora. Looking back to his time in the back alleys, he sees his former self and admits that everything feels very unfamiliar to him. He feels that it's like he's now wearing clothes that don't suit him. He keeps staring at the reflections on the glass window, and then he even sees his red-haired best friend from the back, Alice. Unfortunately, she's scowling at him in this mild hallucination, and even the appearance of his former self doesn't look happy with him. Their judging eyes continue to glare at him, and he starts to feel bad when he remembers that Gamina is allegedly staying in a convent. Now at this point, he can't bear to look at the images anymore, so he turns away from the glass window with his eyes closed. Vlad can only hope that she's doing well right now because he believes that she'll also be wearing clothes that don't suit her since she's in the convent. But with this in mind, he walks away from accusing reflections and makes his way down the hall. Elsewhere, people are talking about the new attendant who is becoming famous in the Bayzid household. They've also heard about how the genius boy pulled out Aura and Dearmer, but that's not all. They've heard about him from the rumors going around. They've also been able to discover that Vlad is incredibly handsome. We get to see that the people gossiping are actually sisters in the convent. Some of them are busy talking about how good-looking the talented boy is, while a redhead among them is busy scrubbing the floor. All of a sudden, the other sisters start describing what they've heard about Vlad's appearance, talking about his blonde hair and blue eyes. The person scrubbing hears this and pauses suddenly. The sisters feel that he could be of noble origin, and since he pulled his aura at such a young age, they think that he could also become a knight who represents the North. The redhead disregards the little gossip when he hears them suggesting that he is of noble origin. It turns out that the sister scrubbing the floor is actually Gamina, Vlad's old friend. With all the things they're saying about the boy talent pulling Aura and becoming a knight shortly, she concludes that it can't be Vlad because she feels that there's no way he could have grown so rapidly already. But then again, she feels that it would be nice if he's alive and doing well. At this point, Gamina is distracted, so the other sisters notice that she's no longer working and try to bully her. They ask her if she's playing around and remind her that she hasn't donated. They claim that she should think of repaying what she owes by working all her life. As such, they tell her to finish scrubbing the floors and then do the dishes if she doesn't want to get scolded by the head sister. The three bullies keep talking about how Gamina has nowhere to go if she leaves the convent and how she also doesn't even have anyone to get her out. So they feel that it wouldn't be such a bad thing for Gamina if she gets used to working there continuously. They leave the room and tell her to keep working and finish everything before it's time for lunch. She just smiles as she continues to scrub the floor. She feels that it's a good thing she knows all of this from Rose's smile. But then again, she starts to feel bad when she remembers something. Gemma remembers that this place isn't for everyone. Just as she's thinking about this, a memory starts to play back in her mind. In this flashback, we see the head sister talking about how the convent is one of the places closest to God. She explains that they cannot house girls who put themselves in filthy places. She's talking about the lowborn girls that she doesn't want in the convent with her. However, the spokesperson Marcel, who brought them, insists that the girls are all virgins and that the bishop watched over them. Regardless, the head sister claims that they can't just take in all the girls all of a sudden. However, Marcella doesn't want to hear the crap, so she snaps at the head sister and reminds her of how much money she has donated to the convent. She's very upset because she knows that the sisters can feed the girls for 10 years and still have money remaining with the amount she's donated. The head sister tries to argue, but she's at a loss for words. Before she can come up with a counter, she's cut off again, but this time it's by Gamina who's asking Marcella where she is going to be staying. However, 
she tells them not to worry themselves, and after that, she leads them into the convent. Not mind what the head sister has to say, but just then, the head sister stops her and tells her that she can't enter the sacred building. The gray haired lady admits that she wasn't even hoping to. She asks the head sister to take care of the kids and informs her that they're all good at work. Just then, a group of men appears out of nowhere. They spot the woman and the girl she was carrying with her, so they charge at them. When the woman hears the men coming at them, she yells for the kids and the head sister to get in quickly. They manage to run inside the building in time, but unfortunately, Marcella gets caught by one of the scumbags. She struggles to free herself, but to no avail. Gamina can only scream in horror as she's equally dragged away to safety by the head sister. The hoodlums take Marcella away and leave the others. They drag her back into the woods by her hair, and despite all her struggles, she's still unable to escape. The doors of the convent are closed behind her, meaning that Marcella is now completely at the mercy of the bandits. The flashback ends, and we catch up with Gamina, who's still scrubbing the Vladoer in the present. She starts to sob as she recalls this memory and also cries when she remembers Vlad. Elsewhere, we see him standing outside a house, looking dumbfounded by the sight in front of him. He's left in awe after he sees the Kanner household mansion and finally realizes why they're said to have so much influence in Sturma even though they're not a noble family. He had a feeling they were wealthy, but what he's looking at right now is just insane as far as he's concerned. As he enters the gate with his chubby friend, he's greeted by an old man along with several other servants. This old-timer turns out to be the family butler, which explains why Potri is so excited to see him again. He runs toward the man with outstretched arms until he gives him a big warm hug. Potri admits that he missed the old man since it's been a very long time. The butler reveals that he's also happy to see him after such a long time. Potri quickly asks about his father, so the butler informs him that his dad is currently welcoming the guests who suddenly arrive. Since the man of the house is currently occupied, the butler suggests that Potri and his guests look around the pasture, which is the pride of their household. Vlad politely accepts the offer, claiming that he's cool with it. So the old man thanks him for being considerate. However, Vlad has one special request, which is to see where the horses are first because he has big expectations. The butler doesn't have a problem with that, so he assures him that they'll do that in a while. He claims that the lord of the house will introduce the horses personally, but admits that it's not a bad idea to take a look at them before. Then, with this in mind, the old butler shows them the way to the place where the horses are kept. Vlad was probably hoping to get better results with the horses by coming to the Kaner family estate, but unfortunately, there's not much progress because the horses here find him just as repulsive as the others before. It's like they're all terrified of him because the moment he starts getting close, they freak out and run for their lives. Even the cattle run away when they see him. Vlad is disappointed with this turn of events, but all he can do is just stand there and allow the embarrassment to consume him. He feels like he should just die already because not only are the horses still running away from him, but now even the cows won't let him ride them. As for the sheep, well, they don't want him either. So when the butler sees this, he realizes that it's a really serious problem. The old man feels that it's probably supernatural, so he asks Vlad if he's visited the convent for this matter yet. Vlad doesn't think it should be that bad, so he assures the butler that it's not a curse because his guarantor is even priest Andrea. The old man is surprised to hear this, but Vlad just ignores him because he's too busy going crazy from his current problem. He watches the farm animals continue to run away from him, and he starts to feel that it doesn't even matter if he uses aura. He can't ride horses anyway, so what's the use? He starts to see himself eating dust and running after other nights when they're all making cool cavalry charges. He says this feeling devastated, and Potri is also hurt by this. So, he decides that he's going to help his new best friend at all costs. He promises to show Vlad all the horses in their pasture until they find one that suits him because he believes that they'll surely have the right one for him. Vlad has his hope renewed a little when he hears this, and Potri assures him that they'll get him a horse he can ride. He reveals that there are beautiful horses Vlad hasn't seen yet, the horses with a good pedigree that the lord of the house brought. Potri promises that he'll play with his dad to show Vlad the horses and then suggests that they look at the others tomorrow. The chubby friend encourages him to just enjoy his first dinner in their house. Later that evening, we see that the Kaner household welcome feast is being prepared. Potri shows Vlad the kitchen full of people roasting all kinds of meat, and the young swordsman confesses that it's indeed a spectacular sight to behold. There's nothing moderate about the Kaner household after all. Just then, Potri notices that his father is back. 
Lord Orson Kaner, and apologizes for not being around to welcome the special guest personally. He greets the Lord as well and introduces himself as Sir Jaeger's squire. The Lord just laughs excitedly in response, claiming that he already knows, since the rumors about the genius boy have already spread all over Sturma. Lord Orson welcomes him once again, knowing that his guest is the boy who activated the Sword Master's discipline. As far as he's concerned, Vlad is a new star who has been born in Sturma, and he's glad that poetry has made a great friend. Orson suggests going inside to chat while the meal is being prepared and expresses his delight to be hosting such precious guests. At this point, Vlad remembers that he wasn't the only guest to arrive earlier, so he wonders who the others are and if they're going to sit together. Poetry suddenly reveals that all the other guests are Bayzid natives, so this makes him a lot more curious. They finally enter the hall, and Vlad is bewildered when he sees a familiar person sitting comfortably inside. He wonders what the man is doing there, and it turns out this guy has also been waiting for Vlad because he suddenly wears a creepy smile and reveals that it's been a long time since he saw him. Realizing that it's Sir Luckier, Vlad and Potri bow to greet him, and Vlad admits that he wasn't expecting to see him. Luckio invites Vlad to join him for a meal, claiming that the food looks too good to refuse. Vlad is embarrassed at this point and immediately regrets rejecting the nuts that Luckio offered him back then. He looks around and notices everyone glaring at him, so he concludes that they all hate him for insulting the first son of the Bayzid family. Besides that, he also beat up their squires earlier, so they have more than one reason to hate him. However, he feels that he'll gain nothing if he's intimidated by them. So he decides to man up and accepts Luckier's offer, claiming that he's been waiting for it. Luckier is intrigued when he hears this, so he smiles mischievously and asks if they can see the same time tomorrow since Vlad is on vacation. He is taken by surprise with this question, and then Luckier suggests that they go somewhere together when they meet. The next day, Luckier and his knights ride horses out to a desert-like place for some reason, and Vlad is extremely bored because he's been dragged along. Just then, a beast woman from the Lou family named Dorothy confronts him. She accuses him of staring at her and asks if it's his first time being with a beast tribe. He bluntly claims that there's always a first time for everything, so she aims that it would have been weirder if he had seen them before. She heard he was from Sora, so she wanted to know how he became one of the Bayzids. In response, he suggests that his being a Bayzid is just as weird as Lutgear's mage being a beast man. She gets offended by this and then asks him if he's ever really used Aura because she doesn't get how he can't ride a horse. I mean, even chubby Podri can ride one. But Vlad tiredly informs her that things happen in life. Dorothy insists that his case is too much, but he's already tired of her babbling at this point and starts to regret coming on vacation. He wonders why it's falconry out of the blue, and the beast girl disturbs him again to see if he's listening to her. Vlad asks her if all beast men are this talkative, so she accuses him of being racist for asking something like that. He then asks if all mages are talkative, so she claims that he's discriminating against her job. Watcher finally comes to the rescue when he tells Dorothy to give Vlad a break. However, the beast woman just calls him a bastard and accuses him of making shitty expressions whenever he looks at her. Lutgear just blames her for pestering him so much, which leaves her defeated. One of the knights suggests a spot, and Lutgeo agrees with it since they can get a better view on all sides. Potri thinks that they might have come hunting, but Vlad doesn't care. Besides, he doesn't think they're here to hunt because they've not let the falcon out of its cage. Just then, a knight calls Lutgear's attention to something in the distance, and that's when they see that it's a group of pilgrims. He didn't expect to see them, so he told his men to raise the Vlad Axe to show the people their intentions. The Bayzid family banner is raised, and Lutgear decides that it's now time to start finding prey. Elsewhere, in the plains, we see a horde of horses. But while all the others are grazing together, one of them is singled out. The black majestic horse stays on the cliff like the kind of all the others, but while it's just chilling, a bolt of energy hits it from under the earth. What could this energy be, and why could somebody be targeting a lonesome horse out of all things? Rudiger's army tracks the group of pilgrims from across a cliff. While the pilgrims are walking on foot and pushing their wagons along the wilderness road, Rudiger and his bandits follow them closely, but they don't make any form of contact. It's almost like they're just stalking the travelers without any intention to actually approach them. Seeing this, Vlad begins to feel bored. As far as he's concerned, this little experience is not hunting, but it's more like an escort for the pilgrims. As such, he concludes that Rudiger didn't even come to this deserted place for the falconry in the first place. However, while he's still grumbling and complaining at the back of his mind, 
the wagon he's sitting in suddenly bumps into a huge rock, and the impact from the collision is so great that he almost gets thrown off. At this point, the motion sickness starts to set in as the little journey gets even more frustrating. So, he decides that it would even be better to walk. Vlad starts to get off the wagon, and when Potri sees this, he asks him if he's okay. He already has an idea of what's going on, so he asks Vlad if he feels like puking, but the young hero claims that his condition isn't that bad. But then again, he has no choice but to admit that his heart has been thumping continuously for a while. At this point, Vlad is already even sweating and holding his chest because of this feeling. As Vlad continues the journey on foot, Potri asks him if it's because the carriage is shaking so much, but Vlad doesn't even know what he can blame. So, he concludes that he'll probably be fine if he just walks for a while instead. As he looks around, he realizes that the view of the place is actually pretty good, and it seems that Potri has already been thinking about this for a while because he claims that he's been wanting to show it to our young swordsman. The chubby friend reveals that the grassland they're currently on stretches all the way to Varna. He claims that monsters even appear sometimes, but he thinks that it's nothing to worry about this year. And that's all that's to Sir Joseph. As they reach a point on the cliff, Vlad expresses his shock to hear that Sir Joseph is the one to thank for no longer having monster troubles. Vlad doesn't understand how the young master is involved in such a thing. Potri reveals that the current peace is a result of the subjugation from last winter, which Vlad also participated in. Upon hearing this, a smug look appears on Vlad's face because he remembers just how impressive his performance was in it. He decides to get a little cocky too by suggesting that he has a little stake in this beautiful scenery as well. Before the chubby kid can even respond, they're both distracted by a sound coming from the distance, and Vlad gets concerned immediately. He wonders what could be causing the noise and the dust in the air. That's when we see a horde of wild horses running through the plains right in the direction of Vlad and Potri. The moment Vlad sees the danger heading their way, a wave of horror washes over him. But it's not just fear that he's feeling, there's something else. Among all the horses charging at them, there's a distinct black stallion at the forefront, and the whole thing gets Vlad so rattled up because he has no idea what's going on. The horses don't even slow down a bit, and with each passing moment, they inch closer to Rudiger's little band of knights and bandits. From the top of the cliff, Rudiger and his men can see that it's a horde of wild horses speeding below. They notice that the horses are quality ones too. However, due to the current circumstance, Rudiger feels that they're unwelcome for their guest traveling as well. But then again, he suddenly notices that they're traveling south, and he doesn't know why. The other men realize this too, and they're also puzzled immediately because it doesn't really make sense. It's strange to them since the horses should actually be heading north by this time because that's where the new sprouts will grow. Besides that, the horses are running way too fast for a normal migration, so they realize that the horses' movement feels strangely urgent for some reason. As such, Rudiger starts to think that the horses are being chased by something. He's not the only one feeling that something is off, because Vlad is also being overly troubled by the horses. It appears that his heart is thumping fast again, and this time it's even worse than before. At this point, he sees the black horse in front again, and from the look in the animal's eyes, Vlad realizes that the horses are frightened. He keeps looking into the horse's eyes, and he's so concerned because he doesn't know what would make such a huge horde so afraid. He wonders what it could be, and while he's deep in thought, the knights on the cliff conclude that there's an earthquake. However, Vlad doesn't believe that it's an earthquake, because he can remember this particular vibration very vividly like it was just yesterday. In other words, he knows exactly what it is. And before he can reveal this to us, we get to see it by ourselves because something shoots out of the ground behind the horses. It's almost like a volcanic eruption with the kind of force that it shoots out with. And as the dust starts to clear a bit, we finally get to see the massive work monster showing its ugly head. The black horse from earlier gets even more terrified at this point, And everyone around to see the huge monster is instantly overwhelmed by fear. Vlad is particularly horrified because he's all too familiar with this beast. His eyes almost pop out when he sees the giant worm because he instantly identifies it as one of the remnants of the fallen dragon. It's none other than this death worm. This destructive freak of nature is so powerful, and it doesn't even hide what a menace it can be. The death worm digs in and out of the ground like a high-powered drill on steroids, and right now, this unstoppable force has only one thing on its mind, to kill every horse in its sight. The death worm easily catches up to one unfortunate horse in the horde, and with a single bite, it takes off the animal's head. The beast girl in the travel band witnesses this gory scene and instantly feels that something is strange. 
Well, it turns out that this killing machine shouldn't be going on a rampage with this killing spree, and that's because the death worm isn't supposed to be a carnivore. This leaves her very shocked and confused because she has no idea why it's happening. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter if she knows why or not because right now, this massive maggot is hungry for a taste of blood. The horse's leg dangles out between the teeth of the bloody death worm, and that's when she notices something else about the monster. There's obviously something wrong with the death worm, so the girl notices that there's a strange energy flowing out from its forehead. The situation gets more difficult from here because the death worm's sudden entrance has shifted the wild horse's course. Now the horde is running directly toward the innocent pilgrims whom Rudiger and his men are supposed to be giving safe passage. One of Rudiger's men informs him of the horrible development, and he's just as confused as the informant. The strange energy continues to radiate from the death worm's head, and as such, the horses refuse to slow down. The horses keep running for their lives, and unfortunately, they're still headed in the direction of the pilgrims. The massive bloodthirsty worm follows the horde, which just puts the pilgrims in even more danger. The innocent pilgrims begin to run for their lives, but it's only a matter of time before they're either trampled upon by the horses or devoured by the deadly monster at the back. As a result, Rudiger decides to take action immediately, so he calls out to Dorothea and asks her what the death worm reacts to since she's the expert around. Unfortunately, this expert is as terrified as anyone else. She does not seem to have any plan, and it also looks like the death worm doesn't have any weakness she knows of because it doesn't have eyes or ears. However, she knows that it reacts to underground vibration, so that would be the only way to get its attention. Rudiger notices that the beast girl is already paralyzed in fear, so he demands that she pull herself together and then find a way to lure the death worm away from the pilgrims. Hearing the first Bazid son give such a stern order, Dorothea snaps out of her fearful state and takes up her assignment. Sir Rudiger takes charge of the situation immediately and then orders Vlad to take Dorothy to higher ground so that he can protect her. He wants them to send him a signal the moment they find a way to get the big worm's attention. Vlad is brave as hell, so he's up to the task, and the second he's given this order, he accepts it and gets to work. Poetry watches our genius swordsman, and he's just in awe of how brave Vlad is. Speaking of brave men, Sir Rudiger takes command to face the horde of wild horses and the death worm behind. He lifts his sword in the air to get the attention of all his men. He doesn't care if what they're about to do makes sense or not, and he lets everyone know that this is how he feels. Rudiger informs them that the only thing important right now is being where one is meant to be and doing what needs to be done. The Bazid family's first son gives this motivational speech to lift the courage and spirits of all his followers, and they all pay attention with so much admiration for him. He reminds them that it's their duty to uphold the mission they receive from the Count. At this point, all the knights are pulling out their swords with a renewed sense of courage, and as Rudiger yells for them to protect the pilgrims, they all charge forward on their horses. Sir Rudiger takes the lead, and they all follow with unwavering faith. Rudiger rides his horse, summoning every ounce of courage he can muster, but he also knows that this current decision goes against all the norms. The whole situation is weird, but that's why he's so certain that a human is being behind the abnormal events on display. With this in mind, Rudiger charges on, feeling insulted by the person responsible for this. At this point, this knight is literally like fire rushing to burn the enemy because he thinks that the person who caused this must be very brave to even think of trying something like this in the land of Bazid. While Rudiger and his loyal warriors are going head-to-head -head with the dangers, we see Vlad, Poetry, and Dorothy staying on the higher grounds. The beast girl tosses a bag of mysterious jewels on the ground while the boys are busy watching the action below. She's trying to remember which one of the jewels is the vibration engraving because she's forgotten. Vlad doesn't seem familiar with the concept either, but that's when the voice in his head informs him that engraving is a type of mystery with divinity and aura. The voice reveals that mystery fulfills the trinity, and at this point, things start to make sense. He realizes that she's Sir Rudiger's mage for a reason. After all, she probably wouldn't have access to such magical items if that wasn't the case. Suddenly, a fiery tornado emerges from under the ground, and this makes Vlad and Potri turn around so they can actually see what it is. The moment they look over at the flames, they're horrified because they quickly realize that it's not just fire but actually the death worm emerged from under the ground with flames. However, that's not even the craziest thing because they also see that Sir Rudiger is fighting off the deadly worm within the flames. It's an unbelievable sight to behold, and this just makes Vlad realize how amazing Sir Rudiger is. 
Vlad is flabbergasted and concludes that the night is on a completely different level from anything he's seen before. However, the voice in his head doesn't seem so impressed. He tells Vlad that the attack is shallow, and this starts to make sense when we see that Rudiger actually didn't prepare well enough for this face-off. The Death Worm makes the night look so tiny, and even though Rudiger has activated his flaming sword, he can also see that he's at a huge disadvantage here. He's like, damn it, at this point because there's almost no way for him to defeat the massive worm now that it's made itself so huge. Regardless, he refuses to give up. He challenges the death worm and mocks it because he doesn't believe that this big maggot is the toughest dragon. Rudiger is as fearless as they come, but this death worm has a point to prove, so it doesn't back down either and goes in for the kill. The monster executes a killer nosedive in an attempt to bury Rudiger and his horse, but the knight urges his animal to get them out of there. Thankfully, the horse manages to run out of the target zone before the death worm can drill itself into the ground. The other knights see that it is an extremely close call, so they're all concerned about their leader. They also let Jiffy's okay, but he just reminds them that they shouldn't let their guard down. He knows that the death worm isn't the kind of beast to run away from a fight so easily, so he wants all his men to stay sharp in case of an ambush or something like that. Vlad watches the whole thing, and he's so tense at this point. The voice in his head equally admits that the situation is getting complicated because no matter how excellent a fighter is, he can't do anything about an underground opponent. Rudiger also knows this, so he refuses to sit around and wait for a sneak attack. As such, he orders his men to get busy and seek out the death worm because he's very certain that the creature is just hiding somewhere and waiting close by. The knights under his command are still as loyal as ever, so they acknowledge the instruction and get to work immediately. As the men begin to search the area, Sir Rudiger can't help but feel so restless. He turns around frantically wondering where the hell the death worm could be hiding. Just a few seconds after the search begins, one of the men yells out to inform Rudiger that he's found the death worm. Unfortunately, it's headed right for the innocent pilgrims they've been trying to protect. That's when the bade son turns around to see the death worm speeding toward the pilgrims from under the ground. The monster is already so close, but this doesn't stop Rudiger from trying to save the people. He charges on his horse and orders all of his men to follow the deadly creature. Vlad can see the terrible turn of events from up on the cliff, and at this point, he knows that there's not much time left. He tells Dorothy that they might have to speed things up now, but when he turns to look at the beast girl, she looks incredibly confused. It's almost like she doesn't even have a clue what she's doing, so Vlad is so disappointed and pissed. The scowl on his face makes this very clear, and then he goes on to scold her for playing around when there's an emergency. Upon hearing him say this, the beast girl snaps at him and insists that she's not playing. She feels insulted that he would even think she's playing at a time like this. She's still holding her painted tail like a creep and insists that what she's doing is a unique method of the wee beasts. Sure enough, the page she was painting on begins to glow, and it starts to look like she knew what she was doing. She claims that she was almost done with it even without Vlad pestering her. Dorothy is so pissed right now and she even takes out her anger on Poetry by calling him a fatty. She gives him the painted paper and asks him to get it to Rudiger immediately. Apparently, this is her signal, and she reveals that they can use it by either rubbing or cutting the paper. However, the chubby guy is just stunned that she's actually referring to him because he probably didn't even expect to be so involved in the matter. Dorothy just yells at him in response, telling him that the marking spell exhausted her completely so much so that it'll even be hard to after conjuring it. As for Vlad, well, he can't even ride a horse, so there's no better person to deliver the message. With the way this currently is, the voice in Vlad's head reminds Vlad that he'd still be slow even if he could ride a horse. After all, a death worm is faster underground than it is on land, and because of this, the voice concludes that Rudiger knights can't even come close to chasing it down with their horses. Upon hearing this, Vlad gets so serious all of a sudden because this means that there's only one way for him to save the pilgrims from the monster before it's too late. He snatches the paper from Poetry's hand and dashes off, leaving them confused. They're stunned when they see him running away, but he doesn't tell them anything other than the fact that this is their last resort. Dorothy is so weak that she can't even stand up or go after him, so she just sits on the floor and desperately asks him what he's going to do. But he just ignores her and jumps down the cliff which just pisses her off to the point that she concludes he's a lunatic. I mean, you can't blame her because he literally just jumped off a cliff without even giving it a second thought. Vlad slides down the hill thinking about how Mr. Joseph and Rudiger are both vying for the position of the family head. On top of that, 
The knights on Rudiger's side are elites of Bayezid, so there's not really any need for a vassal like him to take action in a situation like this. However, the mere thought of that damn creature just won't stop bothering him. He can still remember it down to his bones. Vlad can vividly remember how it feels to have his home destroyed by a huge worm you can do nothing about. As Vlad makes his way closer to the target, the voice in his head tells him to focus on the strength in his toes. But that's about the same time that he trips on a rock. Vlad tumbles down the hill, and as he keeps falling, the voice tells him to roll up his body like a ball to cushion the fall. Vlad tries his best to achieve this, but he's unsuccessful, so by the time he reaches the floor, he slams into the ground. Vlad just lies there at first, and those looking down at him are afraid that he's dead. But then he groans in pain and gets up. Potri sees this, and a tear of joy runs down his face because he's glad to see that his guest is still alive. The fatty is relieved, but Dorothy is just baffled by how Vlad is still alive after falling from such a height. Vlad manages to get himself up together and admits that he didn't even expect to feel okay. He wipes the dust off his body and feels like he should have broken a bone or two at this point. Vlad feels a weird feeling again, and that black horse from earlier turns toward him. It's almost like they are connected in a way. The young swordsman starts to glow with a bright blue light, and the horse just keeps staring at him with so much longing in its eyes. The voice in his head then reveals that this is the blessing and claims that he would have died from the fall if it wasn't for the snake's blessing. Vlad sees his body glowing so brightly, and it's all so awesome to him. The voice in his head admits that it is indeed awesome and then suggests that they visit that tree later with renewed energy. Vlad jets toward the target again, assuring the voice that they'll get another chance to go there. But for now, the only important thing is sending the message to Rudiger and then saving the pilgrims. Just then, Vlad notices something strange about the pilgrims, and that's when he sees a certain old man pushing the wagons. So, he stops right in his tracks. Vlad realizes that this old man is Priest Andreas and he's shocked that the father is the one leading the pilgrims. Seeing this, he begins to wonder where Sir Rudiger is right about now. He sees that they're still very far away, so he's sure that the death worm will get to the pilgrims first at this rate. He's afraid that the priest will be in danger. So, he looks at the marking spell in his hand and realizes that he has a hard choice to make. The voice in his head calls the situation a coincidence and then reminds him that it comes in the form of fate and forces people to make a choice. Vlad curses out when he realizes how tough the choice is, but while he's deep in thought, the death worm inches closer to the pilgrims. Vlad knows that he doesn't have time to hesitate. He decides that he needs to take action immediately, and if he's going to do so, then he can't hesitate. With this in mind, he activates the spell by himself. As he imbues the sword with magic, he stabs the earth and challenges the bastard death worm, revealing that he's here and ready for a fight. This sends energy through the earth, but the voice still feels that it's not enough. He tells Vlad to amplify the vibration so much so that it amplifies his world. Vlad does just that and continues to amplify the vibration in the earth. This triggers a massive surge out of his body, and he remains in the kneeling position for a while. Vlad continues to strain his body, hoping to bring out the kind of power that would destroy the death worm. The plan is to generate the kind of power that would force the monster to come out. After Vlad increases the vibration so much, the massive killer worm blasts itself out of the earth, searching for a worthy adversary. Rudiger is stunned when he sees this, just like Dorothy and Potri, who are bewildered by the terrifying sight in front of them. But while everyone else is afraid, Vlad just stands bravely with his sword in front of the death worm and makes the remnant of the fallen dragon very aware that he is right here and ready to fight. The death worm throws itself at Vlad with its mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth. It goes in for a killer dive, but just when it's about to hit Vlad, the blonde swordsman dodges the strike, causing the monster to bury its head in the ground once again. The force from the crash pushes Vlad back several meters, but he still manages to stay on his feet and maintain his balance after the insane vibrations caused by the killer worm's attempt. He groans in exhaustion, but he doesn't back down. Instead, he holds onto his aura-infused sword and prepares to get back in for another round against the terrifying creature. At the same time, the death worm also gets back up, and so the voice of reasoning in his head finally decides to speak up. It tells him not to think he can even go up against such a beast, and then advises him to back down. The voice informs Vlad that his current world isn't deep enough to fight against the creature. As far as the invisible guy is concerned, Vlad has already managed an incredible feat by just keeping it bound in one place. In response, the pumped-up knight in training reveals that he's aware of all this. With his glowing eyes, he looks back at the horseman coming to his aid. 
be surprised that they're still not ready because of how far away they are. At this point, he probably feels that he'll have to face the creature by himself because even though Ludiger's men are speeding toward him, they still won't be able to make it before the Deathworm's next attack. The killer maggot goes in for another strike. This time it opens its massive mouth and looks like it's about to swallow the blonde kid from Sara. Even in the face of death, Vlad doesn't show any sign of fear. He grips his blade and stares the terrifying monster dead in the eye, ready to take on anything that the worm throws at him. The death worm suddenly drives itself into the ground again, and this time it sends more powerful shock waves which fling the knight in training away. Vlad rolls and tumbles on the ground, but he quickly gets back on his feet and is frustrated when he sees that the death worm just went underground again. The worm drills its way into the ground before the dust even starts to clear, and by the time Vlad goes over to check, all he sees is a massive hole in the earth. He looks around in confusion, wondering where the deadly creature is now because he already knows that it's going to try and sneak up on him. His wild eyes skin the area as he becomes completely alert. He turns quickly and looks all over the place from left to right, hoping to see where it's going to attack from. However, after a short while, he doesn't sense the Deathworm's presence anymore, and that's when he realizes that the deadly monster might be heading towards the pilgrims. Because of this, Vlad starts to panic, and just when he's thinking that the worst is about to happen, he senses the Deathworm again. His eyes widen in horror when he realizes that the gigantic killing machine is right under him, and he stands there frozen in shock because he has no idea what to do next. The earth beneath him cracks away, confirming what he sensed, and at this moment, it looks like this might be the end for young Vlad. The voice in his head yells at him to move quickly, and he tries to get out of there as fast as he can. But despite his efforts to escape, he already knows that it's too late for him. The death worm blasts itself from under the earth and swallows Vlad in the blink of an eye. Ludiger and his men witness the tragic scene from afar, and the young leader is devastated. Ludiger refuses to let the death worm take Vlad from him, so he tries his best to pick up the pace on his horse. But it's pretty obvious that he might not make it in time. The death worm just sits there after swallowing the young swordsman, like it's trying to digest its food or something. It slobbers all over the place and remains still, giving Ludiger enough time to close the distance between them. However, he suddenly sees something blasting through the dust coming towards him. To his surprise, it's Vlad and what's even more shocking is the fact that the kid is riding a horse. Not just any horse, but that mysterious black horse we saw earlier. Ludiger's eyes almost pop out when he sees this, but it turns out that he's not the only one baffled by this. Even Vlad can't believe that he's riding an actual horse. It's almost like a dream for him because he probably never imagined he'd find a horse that would let him ride. The voice in his head is also taken aback by this sudden turn of events, so he decides to guide Vlad by telling him to look at the horse's forehead through his world. Without hesitation, Vlad does just that and sees a strange aura radiating from the horse's head. Vlad feels like he knows what it is, and the voice completes the thought by revealing that the horse is a spirit. Just then, that strange smoke-like aura turns into some kind of glowing sickle attached to the horse's forehead. This makes it look like a unicorn, and as it charges forward, the voice is surprised to see that Vlad has found himself a horse with one horn blood mixed in it. The scene becomes bright and shiny again all of a sudden, and we see the kid having the time of his life as he rides the magical horse through the fields. Vlad is so excited that he can't even stop himself from laughing out loud. His laughter fills the air, and it's almost like he's in a dream. He starts to imagine what a horse's point of view looks like. The powerful horse springs into the air and all he can think about is how crazy it feels to be able to ride such a fast animal. His little daydream is interrupted when Sir Ludiger and his men suddenly catch up to him. Ludiger asks Vlad if he's all right, feeling pretty concerned. So Vlad assures him that he's good. The knight glances at the sword in Vlad's hand, and he's surprised to see that the boy has already imprinted on it. It's glowing with mysterious symbols on it, and he remembers how the young swordsman threw himself at the ferocious monster without hesitation. Because of this, he's intrigued by the boy's mindset of being ready to risk everything for others. He didn't expect such a trait from a boy this young, and so he concludes that Vlad has thrown himself into action with the discipline of a sword master. With this in mind, Sir Ludiger finally commends Vlad for his great and courageous decision earlier. He claims that the boy executed his duty more honorably than any of the other knights. The young boy from Sara didn't expect that, and he was taken aback by it. However, he manages to shake off the shock and quickly thanks the first Bazid son for the compliment. Sir Ludiger suddenly asks Vlad if he thinks he can maneuver the new horse according to his will. 
Vlad seems surprised when he hears this because he honestly doesn't know the answer to that question. Ludiger then reminds him that the pilgrims will only be safe when the death worm has been cut down. So he makes it very clear that they have to place their bets immediately. Vlad seems to be overwhelmed by the monster, and it's almost like he's afraid because he tries to remind Sir Ludiger that the creature is a fallen dragon's remnant. However, just when the fear tries to speak out, the knight stops him, revealing that he can deal with the big worm. This shocks Vlad, but it also gives him renewed strength and courage to fight. The two swordsmen make eye contact, and Vlad can already tell that something crazy is about to happen. The terrifying death worm comes around for another clash, so Ludiger suggests that Vlad will be able to lure it away since he has the engraving of Dorothea. Besides that, he's riding a great horse, and the knight is confident that Vlad can perform the job. Because of this, the young swordsman starts to doubt if he'll be able to ride the horse. He looks at the horse with uncertainty, and the gentle creature stares back at him with a very vulnerable look in its eye. Because of this, he finally realizes what is going on. This makes him understand that the black horse is here to save its herd as well. With this in mind, he gets some extra motivation and courage to keep fighting. So he springs forward with the horse, feeling that they should give it a go together. The black horse gives him the kind of energy he's expecting, so he's confident enough to tell Sir Lutiger that he can lure the giant deathworm away. Upon hearing this, the knight orders the young swordsman to go around the hill and return to him. He claims that he'll be ready on the other side when Vlad gets to him. So Vlad blasts himself into action without any form of hesitation. Vlad rides away from the rest of the knights and bandits, so the giant death worm follows him immediately. He looks back at the monster and sees it following him with incredible speed. So he's glad that the plan is working perfectly. As such, he urges the horse to run even faster, and when the others see how the black stallion blazes through the grass, they're astounded by the incredible acceleration. Sir Lutiger is impressed when he sees it too, and a small smile creeps up on his face because of it. He's glad to see that both Vlad and his new horse are great together. After all, that's going to ensure their victory over the death worm. Speaking of the death worm, it's still hot on Vlad's tail, and despite the horse's insane acceleration, it manages to cover the distance in a short while. The voice in his head tells him to put the sword down and explains to him that he has to let his existence flow through the engraving's vibrations. Vlad looks at his glowing sword and does exactly what his voice tells him. He puts the sword down and drags it along the ground as the horse speeds along. His eye begins to glow again because he starts straining himself to control the power of the sword. In a short while, powerful surges of energy are produced from the sword, leaving a bright trail wherever the horse passes. Now, Vlad can see that a dragon is chasing him, and this realization gives him the willpower to keep pushing. The horse doesn't slow down either, and they both push themselves to the limit in the hopes that they can defeat the deadly death worm on their tail. A voice informs Vlad that this dragon is following the shining inside of him, and as Vlad continues to lure it away, we see that Sir Ludiger and his men have arrived at where they're to protect the pilgrims. The knight orders some of his men to move the pilgrims to a safe place and tells the others to prepare for any emergency that might come up. The loyal men take the orders and get right to work immediately. Elsewhere, Vlad is riding the horse, and it looks like they've managed to outrun the killer maggot. Unfortunately, that's not the case because, in the blink of an eye, the death worm blasts itself out from under the ground. This time it's even closer to Vlad than it was before, and when Ludiger sees that the kid is coming toward the rendezvous point, he starts to prepare himself for what's ahead. All of a sudden, Sir Ludiger starts to prepare himself and his sword for the clash. A fiery aura surrounds him, and in the midst of it, he taps the blade of his sword with his finger. The next thing we see is a huge pool of magma, suggesting that this is Sir Ludiger's world. Vlad is still dragging his sword along the grass and creating a glowing trail for the death worm to follow when he's suddenly stunned by what Ludiger is doing. He's dumbfounded by it, and when he takes a second look at the flood of molten magma around the night, the voice in his head confirms that the guy momentarily expanded his world with this move. The voice informs Vlad that this is a method used by only knights that can deeply observe themselves. Ludiger is certainly one of them. The voice admits that the guy turned out to be a much greater knight than he thought initially. Now, Vlad can see that the one seemingly gentle leader is, in fact, ferocious. Vlad listens closely to all of this with his mouth wide open because he's still in awe of Sir Ludiger's power. He probably never imagined that the gentle guy would have so much power inside of him, but now Vlad realizes that the knight is easily capable of burning down his world. Anyway, in the real world, we see that Vlad is still being hunted down by the death worm. It's just a few feet away from catching him at this point, 
And although the black horse has amazing speed and stamina, it's only a matter of time before the relentless beast gets them. However, the high-speed chase is suddenly interrupted when the killer maggot senses something that distracts it completely. The creature suddenly slows down, allowing Vlad and his horse to extend the gap. This should be a good turn of events, but not exactly, because Vlad notices that the monster stopped chasing them, so he turns around to check what's up. That's when he realizes that the Death Worm is now heading right for Sir Lutiger. The voice sees this as well and curses out because he knows that the dragon's remnant just detected the threat of Lutiger's world. The knight is still busy concentrating his power, so he probably has no idea that the destructive worm is speeding toward him. By this time, Vlad already understands the gravity of the situation, so he's just as frustrated as the voice in his head. He curses out as well and finally snaps in anger. He decides that he can't let things continue like this, but he also knows that he's far too weak to get the maggot's attention away from Sir Lutiger. He's so confused, and then suddenly the black horse turns around so swiftly that he almost falls off. He struggles to hold on and is perplexed at how the creature just changed course without him doing anything. He yells out, trying to regain control of the horse, but it just ignores him and starts running after the death worm at full speed. When Vlad sees what the horse is trying to do, he simply asks the bratty creature where it's running, but the horse still ignores him. Just when it looks like the horse is going crazy, it takes things up a notch and starts running in circles. It runs so fast that it looks like there are two of them, and this somehow gets the worm's attention. Vlad is probably dizzy by now, so he yells at the horse because he's afraid that they're way too close to the death worm. Unfortunately, his little attempt to scold the horse is once again ignored. The horse suddenly starts neighing loudly, like something is up, and then even the voice in his head is shocked because he can't believe what's about to happen. The horse starts to glow, and by this time, the blonde swordsman is starting to understand what's happened. He's surprised by it, but then it's confirmed when the glowing horn appears on the horse's forehead again. Seeing this, the voice reveals that Vlad's world and the white snake's blessing are resonating with the mysterious animal. Just then, both Vlad and the horse begin to glow, and as the black stallion goes up on its hind legs, the voice also reveals that a long-forgotten divine secret is rising from the memories of this world. Meanwhile, the Death Worm is still watching patiently and waiting for a perfect moment to strike. While that's happening, Vlad and the horse finally merge their powers. They're ready for action, and when the monster sees this, it goes in for the kill without hesitation. The worm lunges at them, so he urges the horse to charge as well. With insane force, the horse takes off, and as it runs, we realize that this duo is made up of a unicorn without a horn and a knight without a horse. It's a funny scenario at first glance and one would think that they stand no chance against the deadly monster, but the truth is that on the horizon where they both meet, they become one powerful force. As far as this story is concerned, this union of a knight and his horse signifies the appearance of a single white star that just happened to appear in the pitch-black night sky. The horse blazes through the fields, and Vlad tightens the grip on his sword as he prepares to strike. At the same time, we see that Sir Lutiger's sword is already bright red with heat because of how scary that looks. The voice in Vlad's head still feels the boy and his new horse aren't doing enough yet. He informs them that Ludiger's world is slowly getting stronger, so he claims that it's just a matter of time before they lose the giant worm's attention again. Vlad grunts when he hears this because he's already straining himself so much to compete with the knight's power. Unfortunately, he realizes that he's reaching his limit, which means that he can't squeeze out any more aura to keep the monster's attention. Despite Vlad's exhaustion, the horse doesn't slow down and just keeps galloping furiously toward the target. Just when it looks like the duo is one man down, Lutiger's men arrive with reinforcements. They urge him not to give up and encourage him to keep fighting. All the eyes of the knights and bandits suddenly start glowing with the power radiating from them. The voice in Vlad's head is confident that it's enough to face the death worm. One of the knights rides faster until he catches up to Vlad and then tells the kid to keep riding at the same pace until he goes past Sir Lutiger. Meanwhile, the head knight in question is still very distracted by his power concentration and looks very absent-minded. Vlad speeds toward him and calls out to him, hoping to wake him up from the trance. That's when Lutiger finally opens his flaming eyes again, and as the army of knights rides past him, he commends Vlad for a job well done. Vlad and the others have successfully lured the Death Worm away from the pilgrims. Sir Lutiger feels that it's his turn to take over and take on the deadly creature. With this in mind, he begins to expand his lava world again and informs the dirty maggot that it's in base territory now. 
This is a land where chaos shall not be brought by creatures like it. Ludiger's eye bursts into flames, and with the way, the veins in his face bulge out. With this insane pinned-up rage, the knight creates a flaming tornado and swings it at the death worm, telling it to be gone for good. A huge concentrated beam of fire comes down from the sky after the tornado disperses, and this transforms the whole place into a terrifying hellscape. With the firepower generated, Litiger blasts the death worm. The flames are mighty and extremely terrifying to the point that all the pilgrims watching are horrified by the sight. On the other hand, the knights under Litiger's command are just excited to see their boss displaying such incredible power. As for Vlad, he's just stunned because he finally realizes that this is the world of a knight who can contemplate over himself, a true world. The Death Worm is continually burnt by the unlimited flames, and as Vlad witnesses the insane show of power on display, he admits that this is a sight light years away from common sense. Seeing the knight's world is like watching a mountain that goes up to infinity. To him, the kid is left in a state of awe, and he begins to wonder if Godin can even do something like this. He thinks about Sir Jaeger and Sir Pablo too, wondering if they're even up to this level. Then finally, he asks himself the big question, will I be able to do this too? The voice hears his thoughts and assures him that he's capable of such insane powers, but that's only if his world is so unspeakable to the point that nothing can ever cause it to waver. After a while, we see that Litiger has completely vanquished the monster, and as he watches the remaining flames burn wildly, Vlad appears behind him asking if he's okay. The knight smiles as he welcomes Vlad back before commending him for a job well done. Vlad is worried that the flames will burn down all the grasslands at this rate, but the knight just assures him that everything will be fine because the grasses are pretty moist. He claims that the flames will only last for a while, but more importantly, he reveals that he wants to have a refreshing glass of beer. Ludiger tries to get up, but his shaky legs fail him, so he falls back on his butt. Then the voice suggests that the consequences of expanding his world for a limited time have finally caught up with the knight. Ludiger teasingly asks if Vlad won't help him up, but the kid just flops down beside him and claims that he'd rather fall as well. The senior knight finds it amusing, but he doesn't even have a response to Vlad's antics, so he just smiles and changes the topic from what he saw earlier. Vlad is an excellent writer, but that doesn't tally with all the rumors he heard. In response, Vlad explains that he wasn't the problem, so Ludiger takes a look at the horse and admits that it's remarkable. Vlad agrees with him, and that's when the quiet conversation is interrupted by Ludiger's men, who've come to celebrate the victory. They praise the kid for an awesome performance and claim that it's good enough to make them open up their vassal slots. One of them commends Vlad especially, claiming that he hopes they meet again. So the shy boy thanks him nervously. Just then, someone else calls out to Vlad, and he's surprised to see that it's Father Andreas. He's so glad that the priest is safe, and the old man just excitedly claims that he finally sees what he didn't earlier during Vlad's clash. He saw a bright light, and even though he had seen it before, he wasn't sure what it was. It was like a light that pierced through the pitch-black darkness. All of a sudden, the old man goes on his knees and holds the boy's hands, leaving him stunned. Eden thanks Vlad, calling him Vlad of Sora. The young knight is so confused by this, but the priest goes on to pray to the Lord, claiming that the boy who received God's will has acted solely on it. Still on his knees, Father Andreas prays for the Lord to comfort the young boy who protected his world and prays that he blesses the shining boy with his pity and compassion. On this day, countless hearts turned into a single light, all because this young boy's world expanded. As the story continues, we catch up with a certain character back and base it on a warm evening. The sun is setting, and the lighting is perfectly sitting on the noble family's mansion. Inside, we see a familiar hand with scars holding some kind of letter. Then the owner of these scarred fingers suddenly asks if he's sure that the content of the message is 100% correct. Here we see that it's Count Bazid asking his special advisor about a surprising message he just received. The white-haired advisor assures the Count that the letter is correct and then informs him that Dorothea was the one who sent it through the crystal ball. Upon hearing this, the nobleman grits his teeth in rage because all he did was send the youngsters out just in case. But now they've gone and done something else. He suddenly snaps and asks the advisor if it is dark magic again. So, the old man confesses that some of them have settled in the north. In response, the count remains furious because he feels that the empire is being too lax about the threats and for this reason. The old cursed beings are slowly sticking their heads out. Count Bazid thinks deeply about all of this and looks really bothered by it too. The nobleman stares out the window in rage, 
But then his advisor reminds him that they also have some relieving news as well. He feels that that should at least count for something. So the master agrees with him. The Bayzid family head admits that his advisor is right, and this is because the name of a certain young prodigy keeps popping up nowadays. He begins to recall all the events in which Vlad has proved himself from the previous year's winter monster hunt to the duel of honor at Heinel. The Count thinks about all these notable moments where the star swordsmen shine bright, and then adds Vlad's latest feat to the list since he was involved in matters with the pilgrims. At this point, it's pretty obvious just how much attention Vlad is getting because of his impressive performances lately, and as a result, the Count admits that the Bayzid might just have had to face disgrace if it wasn't for the boy. He can't help but picture the talented kid at the back of his mind, and after seeing Vlad's amazing aura again, all he can feel is admiration for the young boy from Sora. With this feeling inside him, he calmly instructs his advisor to call for his son Joseph. The white-haired old man suspects that the family head is thinking of finally giving the boy permission. He asks the Count to be sure, so the nobleman turns to him and suggests that worthy people should get to enjoy the rights they deserve after all. While all of that is happening back at home, we catch up with Ludiger and his men who are still out in the wilderness. They're currently camping out for the night after successfully saving the pilgrims from the massive death worm. To be fair, Vlad did most of the work, but that doesn't matter right now since they're all enjoying the quiet night seated around fires to keep themselves warm. The pilgrims are with them as well, but while everyone is supposed to be relaxed together, we suddenly notice that something strange is going on. For some reason, Vlad is seated alone with a fire to himself, and he's not even close to the others. He prefers some time to himself, and when we get a closer view, we see that he is cleaning his sword after a hard-fought victory earlier that day. As he tends to the blade, he notices many scratches on it and realizes that the sword went through a lot during his fight against the Death Worm. He didn't expect that the blade would suffer such damage, and while he's still thinking about this, Sir Ludiger appears behind him all of a sudden. The knight straight up asks him why he's acting pitiful all by himself, and the blue-eyed kid is surprised to hear the voice coming from over his shoulders. He turns around to look at the knight who's casually taking a seat beside him. Ludiger asks Vlad where his fat friend is, so the swordsman reveals that Dorothea had taken Porty away earlier because she needed him to do something for her. Upon hearing this, he asks Vlad where the priest is, and Vlad informs him that Father Andreas is currently hanging out with the pilgrims. This explains why he's currently sitting by himself, and the knight gets it immediately with a bottle of wine in hand. Sir Ludiger concludes that everyone is busy and sighs in pity for the lonely blondie. Feeling bad for the boy, he stretches out his hand and offers Vlad a sip from his bottle of wine. Vlad is shocked to see this, and he politely declines the offer by reminding the knight that he's currently polishing his sword. Before he can complete this excuse, Sir Ludiger calls him out on it. He already knows that the boy is trying to refuse his offer, so he reminds Vlad that he's saying no to him again. Ludiger goes for the guilt-tripping technique and reminds Vlad that he didn't take peanuts from him the first time. Besides that, Vlad also didn't pull him up when he asked for help to get up, and now he's crowned it all by rejecting his wine. Thinking about it now, the knight concludes that Vlad has rejected him each time he's reached out to him, so he fakes sadness and asks Vlad if Joseph told him to do all of that. Vlad knows exactly what game the knight is playing. So he's pissed because it would only lead to Master Joseph getting in trouble if word gets out that he refused the first son of the Bayzid family more than once. With this in mind, he is forced to accept the wine. So he takes the bottle from Sir Ludiger and assures the manipulative knight that Joseph didn't put him up to anything. Upon receiving the bottle, Vlad is surprised to see that it's whiskey and Ludiger notices the shock in his eyes. So he probably informs Vlad that this is the liquor of nobles. At this point, Vlad is a lot more relaxed than before, so it doesn't take him more than a moment to take a sip from the bottle. Vlad gulps it, thinking about how Ludiger and Joseph are certainly related. If he wasn't sure before, now he is certain that they're brothers because even though their personalities are different, they've got the same tastes. In the end, the boy from Sora enjoys the whiskey so much that he downs the whole thing, and while he's busy going bottoms up, the knight stares at his sword for a while. Looking at the blade, Ludiger suggests that Vlad has it checked properly when they get back home. This statement finally forces Vlad to drop the bottle. He wipes the excess off his face, 
feeling a little dumbfounded at first before informing the Bayzid's first son that he visited the family's blacksmith a few days ago, who told him that the handle of the sword needs to be taken off. Ludiger finds this a little suspicious because he doesn't understand why they need to take off a perfectly fine handle from a sword. In response, Vlad explains that the blacksmith said the handle was attached to the blade recklessly. Because of this, he either has to find the person who made the sword or he'll have to take the handle off completely. With his bottle of whiskey back with him, Sir Ludiger just teases Vlad, suggesting that the owner of the sword is as reckless as the blade itself. He says this while gulping down his liquor, but then suddenly stops drinking when Vlad informs him that he's not going to take the handle off. The knight is pretty confused when he hears this, so Vlad explains that he can't do it because he doesn't want to lose the sword. Vlad begins to remember the people back in Sora like the old blacksmith who made the sword and his red-haired best friend. The boy lifts the sword, claiming that it holds so much within that he can't let go of it, and this leaves Sir Ludiger speechless for a brief moment. He stares at the boy in awe and then finally regains enough consciousness to keep trying to persuade him. The knight reminds Vlad that he still needs to repair the sword even if he doesn't want to lose the memories especially since it's already starting to look pretty dodgy already. In response, Vlad agrees with him and then insists that it's the exact reason why he has to travel back home in search of the person who made the sword in the first place. Upon hearing this, Ludiger asks the boy where this mysterious blacksmith is, but Vlad is reluctant to admit it at first. Vlad keeps his mouth shut after hearing the question, but then again, he decides to reveal that the person who made the sword is in Sora. The knight isn't too surprised to hear this. It makes a lot of sense to him because he's heard Vlad call himself Lad of Sora several times. Ludiger teases Vlad, but deep down, he knows that the boy is a special talent from The Shining, best known as Vlad of Sora. The senior brother thinks about the name and can't help but admit what a fitting nickname to him. This is just the perfect title for the future swordmaster because earlier on the battlefield, he shot the brightest. The image of Vlad fearlessly riding the majestic black horse earlier flashes across Ludiger's mind, and it makes him reason something. After replaying the memories of the day in his mind, Ludiger finally understands that this is the reason his younger brother has been running around everywhere. Vlad keeps lifting the sword with so much determination in his eyes. So the knight gets up and suggests that he should be able to get the sword fixed soon. At first, Vlad doesn't understand what the senior knight means by this question. So, he expresses his confusion. That's when Ludiger tells him that someone will acknowledge it sooner or later if he hopes for the repair desperately enough. Vlad is perplexed once again when he hears this, and this time he can't even hide the confusion laced on his face while he's still looking up at the senior brother in a daze. Ludiger pats him on the shoulder and begins to take his leave. However, before he exits the scene, he makes sure to tell Vlad that he's been doing a good job living up until now. The statement catches the boy off guard, so he's surprised and sits there while Sir Ludiger finally leaves. The knight tells Lad to sleep early and informs him that they'll be leaving straight to Sturma the following morning. Vlad watches as Sir Ludiger walks away and immediately admits that the leader is right because he believes that someday he'll be able to fix his sword. Vlad thinks deeply about it, knowing that the sword is the reason he has a place to return to, and with this feeling, the memories of his life in Sora begin to play back in his head. He remembers his boss back then and his life back in the bar, which just leaves him very emotional and almost pushed to tears. From a cliff, we can see him still sitting alone with his fire while the rest of the knights and pilgrims have fun on the other side. Just then, the black horse he rode earlier returns and watches him from the top of the cliff. The animal remains quiet, and the more it stares at him, the more we see how connected they are. They practically have the same kind of energy radiating from their bodies, suggesting that they are probably meant for each other. Back in Sturma that same night, we catch up with Lady Oksana, who's quietly doing some stitching and embroidery to pass the time with one of her maids. She doesn't appear to be an expert just yet, because she's still asking the maid if her work is good enough. The young girl commends her stitching skills claiming that the Countess's work is identical to the drawing they're trying to replicate. In excitement, she also shows Lady Oksana the book, so the Countess asks if she can move on to the next crest. She picks it up, and the little girl gladly shows her the next drawing she's supposed to work on, but she quickly picks up the needle and thread to start stitching, 
claiming that she doesn't even need to see the drawing. This next symbol is very familiar to her and vividly engraved into her mind, so she begins effortlessly, even though it's her first time making it. Lady Oksana reveals that she and her siblings only watched their mother do it and never actually tried it. In response, the maid suggests that the countess watching her mother makes it even more precious, to which the lady admits. The nobleman claims that it's precious and suggests that the art is a tradition that's now gradually being forgotten by the people. She thinks about the knights of these days who were raised so preciously and feels that they're not even worthy to lift the flag that belongs solely to them and no one else. Speaking of the knights, the scene changes to the next morning when we see that Ludiger and his men are already prepared to begin their journey to Sturma. As usual, the red-capped son of the Bayzid family leads the way, and as they set out, one of his men calls his attention to a marvelous sight. The guy is so amazed, claiming that he's never seen anything like it in his life. So, Sir Ludiger turns around to see the huge herd of wild horses running nearby. The horses are running side by side with the knights and the pilgrims, so the guy is stunned since he would never have imagined something like that would happen. Seeing all of this, Sir Ludiger calmly admits that it's a rare sight indeed and suggests that it might be the first and the last time it's ever going to happen. As the herd slowly departs from them, the red-capped leader glances back at Vlad with a mischievous look on his face. Vlad is back to life without a horse, and so he's stuck inside the carriage while the rest of the knights ride their horses like real men. He seems pretty bummed about it, and Ludiger notices it because he believes that Vlad and the black horse must have been special like no one else to each other during their short encounter. Now it's all over so they have to return to their lives without each other, and Vlad is taking it a lot harder than the wild horse. He's thinking the same thing as Sir Ludiger, and he looks out the carriage with a long face, knowing that it's now time for him and the amazing stallion to part ways. The powerful horse blazes through the plains, and Vlad tries to contain the pain he's feeling because he knows that he has a purpose to fulfill. Besides that, the horse also must lead its herd, so it really can't work out between them. All of a sudden, the horse stops in its tracks as it reaches the edge of a high cliff. It's forced to stop following the knights and their convoy, so it gets on its hind legs and makes an iconic stance for Vlad to remember. At this point, it's clear that this is goodbye for the two of them, and Vlad already knows that this is it, the last time they'll see each other. Tears fill his eyes as he looks at the horse one last time because he knows that they can only be together up until this moment. It's pretty heartbreaking to watch him say goodbye to the animal, but while he's still in his feelings, Father Andreas pops out of nowhere, telling him not to feel too sad about it. In response, Vlad pretends that he was only saying goodbye for the sake of it, but the old priest already knows that it's not the case, so he bursts into laughter and suggests that it's indeed difficult for humans to be truthful most of the time. To the old man, their lives are like a cycle of highs and goodbyes. The goodbyes bring one to tears, while the highs come as happiness. As far as the priest is concerned, the old man then admits that the scenes from the previous day were a truly amazing encounter even in his eyes, and for this reason, he wonders when the young star will get to see the amazing horse again. As sad as everything looks, Father Andreas doesn't believe that this is the last time that Vlad will see the stallion, because he knows that the depth of connection isn't just decided simply by the time spent together. Hearing all of this, Vlad cheers up, knowing that the priest is right. A smile creeps up on his face once again as he realizes that they'll get to see each other again someday. He's sure of it. With this new sense of belief, Vlad is ready to leave the horse behind for now, and as his traveling party goes farther into the distance, the black stallion just keeps watching. Later that night, a storm rocks Sturma in the house of Bazid. It seems to be having it rough with lightning and thunder all over the mansion. The Count sits in his office looking frustrated, but it's not exactly because of the storm. He's received some troubling news about the fall of Count Ravnoma, so he's still trying to come to terms with the whole thing. He covers his face like the most frustrated person ever and listens to his advisor, who confirms that they just received the urgent news. The nobleman already knew that the West's activity had been strange for a while now, but he never expected that it would end up like this so it makes him wonder how and when Count Gator's house even acquired such strength. The houses of the West allied with Gator as the center of the plan. So now it seems that even Ravnoma, the true leader of the West, got defeated by being outnumbered. 
He didn't stand a chance since he didn't have enough people on his side for the battle. Now that things have gotten this bad, Count Bayzid finds it surprising that the royal family hasn't done anything about it. In response, the advisor claims that they can't usually find out anything about matters that concern the center. The frustrated ruler gets up from his chair with this realization and thinks about how the North has a stronger color than any other region because it was free from the royal family's influence thanks to the unshakable wall built around it. Consequently, they were ignorant of the happenings around them, so it led to the fall of a count family. Bazid can't believe that a guardian of the packed family would fall so easily, and because of this, he feels that the rules and traditions of the past have become meaningless thanks to the new holders of power. The nobleman fears that these are turbulent times, and his advisor agrees, claiming that the empire should know where to draw the line. Count Bazid is afraid that the fall of Count Roma's family is a sign of a new age, and as he looks out the window, he realizes that there's more trouble to handle. It turns out that the so-called pilgrims are actually refugees from Ravnoma, and now they've come to Sturma with the old pact. Elsewhere, Vlad discovers what happened, and he's torn because he doesn't know what to do next. Helping pilgrims was meant to be a good thing, but now he's helped Ludiger, and he knows that Joseph won't be happy about it. He can already imagine Sir Jaeger's face, so he's sure that the green-eyed knight might even beat him to death this time around. Well, it's not like he can do anything to change his fate, so he knocks on Mr. Joseph's door. The young master asks him to come in, and informs him that he's a day early. Joseph is strangely calm and claims that he's heard a little about what happened. He asks Vlad if he's hurt, and Vlad explains that he's fine, but the young master still advises him to take care of himself, which he agrees to do. The blondie is quite confused because it looks like everything is all right. Joseph looks normal, but upon closer inspection of his face, Vlad realizes that he's screwed because the hidden frown becomes more visible by the second. Joseph starts talking about Sora, claiming that he doesn't know much about the back alley there but reveals what he heard about a conflict and asks Vlad if it's true. He's surprised to be asked such questions but suggests that it's true, and then Joseph asks him if he can't send a letter back to Sora, which baffles Vlad some more. When Vlad asks what he means, Joseph finally talks about Gamina, calling her the boy's lover on the continent, but the swordsman clarifies that they're friends. Joseph claims that he's known all along and suggests that Vlad can't send letters back home because he's afraid of people they're getting hurt. The young master claims that he would like to solve that problem but points out how much effort is required. He suggests that the man named One-Eyed Jack is valuable, and Vlad confirms because he knows that Moneybug has formed connections with the most powerful people in Sora. Suddenly, Joseph starts talking about how much Vlad has gone through for him and suggests repaying him accordingly as per their promise to each other. Vlad is confused, so Joseph shows him the flag that represents a knight's honor. In old times, knights went around carrying flags like this, and the young master was bummed that he could never possess one for this reason. He resolved to have a knight who could, and now Vlad has checked all the boxes. Joseph believes that Vlad is a knight worthy of carrying his flag and promises that the Bazid family will give him their full support. After all, He's the man who received Lady Alicia's name and also a vassal of the Bazid family. As such, Joseph wants him to raise his head with pride under his flag and return to his hometown with it. The young master wants Vlad to go slash the worthless people binding him so he can find his true freedom and then come back to him. Sir Jaeger gives his approval in silence, and after seeing this, the young boy from Sora is deeply touched. Vlad thinks about all he's been through to get to this moment from the unadorned sword given to him by the girl and the old man to the identity token given to him by the priests. He was even given the handkerchief with the noble lady's name on it, and now he's been presented with his very own flag with the family's crests on it. All of these would go on to form the boy's roots, and all of these were the boy's accomplishments as well. Vlad is so honored when he thinks about all of this, so he gets on one knee like a true knight, and with tears running down his face, he promises to do as his young lord commands, 